Hello, good morning, welcome or welcome back to the channel. Thanks for checking me out. I'm Zachariah Markowski with Sharper Pen Image Consulting. And today I'm going to step away from my ongoing analysis of George Orwell's 1984 to talk about David Foster Wallace's essay, E Unibus Plurum, which is a take on um, our national motto, you know, from many come one, and then E Unibus Plurum itself means from one come many, right? So this essay is about the average American, their TV habits, where postmodern fiction and U.S. image production fits into our culture and our way of life, and how it's been a dark commercial harvest that has robbed our highest arts, including what the main subject matter reflects, the individual and the group. And he's going to get into this in this essay, and I'm kind of going to jump around through it to highlight what I think are some of the most important beats. But there's been a few themes on my channel all along, and one of them is the, the behavioral attitude and personality differences of people, including fundamental different types of people like the artist or the capitalist. And I know one can technically be the other, but I'm talking about our commercialism and our way of life. Because when I've continued to say our highest forms of expression and their values have been robbed over and over again, what I mean is the mass proliferation and mass consumption of a prefabricated commercial society whose entire way of life from top to bottom is a a schizoid decay of increasing passivity and helplessness. And there's reasons why it's like this, and it's extremely complicated. But we're going to get in it from the fiction writer side of things, from the um, artist side of things, from the observer and even the psychologist side of things. So to start this essay, it begins act natural, right? And it says, fiction writers as a species tend to be oglers. They tend to lurk and to stare. The minute fiction writers stop moving, they start lurk lurking and stare. And I think you can pick up these vibes by reverse engineering a lot of the commercial products in our culture and see that the people who write the stuff are crazy, are insane. You have to be insane to create this kind of commercial garbage. They are born watchers. They are viewers. They are the ones to the subway whose nonchalant stare is something creepy, somehow almost predatory. This is because human situations are writer's food. Fiction writers watch other humans sort of the way gapers slow down for car wrecks. They covet a vision of themselves as witnesses. <laughs> but fiction writers or species also tend to be terribly self-conscious, even by U.S. standards, right? In the, in the U.S., people are very self-conscious species. Devoting lots of productive time to studying closely how people come across to learn. And, and this also goes with our marketing and our commercialism, right? It's all studying and manipulating people. Fiction writers also spend lots of less productive time wondering nervously how they come across to other people, how they appear, how they seem, whether their shirt tail might be hanging out of their fly, whether there might be lipstick on their teeth, whether the people they're ogling can maybe size them up somehow creepy lurkers and starers. The result is that a surprisingly majority of fiction writers, born watchers, tend to, tend to dislike being objects of people's attention. Uh, being watched, being watched, it's like magicians, right? Being watched, the exceptions is, is to the rule. Uh, these writers create the misleading impression that lots of Bell's letters types like people paying attention. Most don't, right? It's they want to take the money and run. The few of us who like attention just naturally get more attention. The rest of us get less and ogle, right? So do you see how he's describing our culture already? as a media and a TV culture and as a culture of writers obsessed with writing and our messaging and how we buy and sell that from each other and how it makes us powerful, all right, and, and marketing. Um, so he's pointing out that, hey, there's these ideals, everyone strives for them, and everyone else just gets less, whether that's less money, less attention, less accolades, right, that there is a competition going on. There are limited resources. So he goes on talking about um, most of the fiction writers I know are, are Americans under 40. I don't know whether, and remember, oh, this, is, this was written in 1990. This is an important note to note here because the internet was barely a new thing, and he's going to talk about that too. I don't know whether fiction writers under 40 watch more television than other American species. Statistici statisticians report that television is watched over six hours a day in the average American household. I don't know any fiction writers who live in Amer uh, average American households. 
right? Because actually, most people in the arts and advertising and marketing, most anyone who's not in the lower 85% of the population, right? They're white collar. They're college educated. They're the ruling class, the political classes, the, the artistic classes. They are a, on a completely different pay grade and they live a different lifestyle than everyone at the bottom. Uh, the people who make the products are not the same as the people who consume the products. It's another way of looking at it. So you're saying, I've never seen an average American household except on TV. Oh, come on. You have ALF and um, Full House, right? Uh, you know, for revisiting the 90s. So right away, you can see a couple of things that look potentially great for U.S. fiction writers about U.S. television. First, television does a lot of our predatory human research for us. American human beings are a slippery and protean bunch. Proteus was a, a Greek uh, demigod or demigod, right? And he was amorphous. He could change forms. Hence, protean means to be kind of, you know, to, you know, blend in like that, to be a chameleon, if you will, um, in real life. It's hard to get to any kind of univocal un handle on as a literary territory that's gone from Darwinianly naturalistic to cybernetically post postmodern in 80 years. And he's talking about how we went from single entendre values and a moral world to a increasingly post-moral society where protest and art are worth nothing, do nothing, achieve nothing. It's just one more product. It's just one more thing to watch on TV, which is boring at this point when there's so many other things on TV because we don't just watch TV anymore. We have the internet, so we have infinite channels, including infinite channels of garbage and, you know, scams and just nonsense of AI hack work, AI bot work, and then human hack work. So before we were flooded in human, a mass of mediocre human hack work or uh, AI hack work, we were already flooded with a mass of mediocre human hack work, right? So do you understand when I say our highest values and arts have been degraded, the whole struggle of the individual in the group has been rendered inert. It's been frozen in stasis. Anyway, he's gonna, he's gonna keep uh, going here. So American human beings are slippery and protean bunch, real life, okay. But te television comes equipped with just a, syn uh, just a syncretic handle. If you want to know what American normality is, what Americans want to regard as normal, and this is maybe what's scary, uh, we can trust television, right? Manufactured products. Why do we have a mass of, uh, of human beings who aspire to imitate and clone what's already been said and done and the same things that keep being said and done, right? Not just that it's commercially viable, that by becoming commercially viable, you become supposedly the ideal image that everyone aspires to, right? And then you can really cram it down people's throat. You know, and in our culture, hatred is just, is more powerful than love. Like I'm thinking specifically of like, like a punk band, like Black Flag, Henry Rollins talking about a lot of what motivated him in life was hatred. All those people who told him, you know, coming from the bottom 85% of the population, coming from the low class, you know, he was just another pro. He was another nobody. And then, you know, it was all the hatred that, that helped fuel him as much as anything that he loved, like music, because everyone who told him he wasn't going to be anything, everyone who told him, you know, you suck, you're not going to amount to anything, you know, that is a story here that it seems like hatred and envy and greed are bigger motivating factors and more powerful than anything else we sell, which is why that's the subtext of our politics and our uh, identity, uh, personality, uh, tribal dividing lines, because it's a power struggle, right? Um, and it, it, it sells itself through commercial mediums, and that's also part of the power struggle. And part of our business is how old business keeps new business from even happening. Kicking it back to the music industry, right? Again, when MP3s became a thing, certain musicians and companies, they wanted to make them illegal. They wanted, they didn't want people to be able to own or download music like that. So you can see how business is always about protecting the status quo, even if it's insane, even if it's old, even if it's backwards, even if in Neanderthal came up with it even if it worked yesteryear but it's going to crash and sink our future you know um these are these are like american habits that play out time and time again we will milk a trend and a thing until it is dead and until it crashes the world economy basically um so he's talking about how television exists as a case study and how it sells americans what they want to regard as normal so if you look at our politics for the last few years and everything else and, and social media culture see that people are insane, right? So, uh, and he gets into that. Uh, it's part of it, 
is that, again, before people were consuming six to uh, 20 hours of social media a day, people saying like technology is the problem, this new technology is a problem. No, television was a problem for our culture before social media even existed. So, you know, I just talk about all this to say he frames this uh, from the perspective of Joe Briefcase, the average American who apparently watches six hours of media a day. Right. So that's what we're working off of. And he talks about how within our aura, you know, if I was going to name this, I meant to say this earlier, but it would be something like irony, tyranny and the dark harvest of a post moral image fiction media culture in the United States of America. Right. That sounds pretty dark and grim, but it gives you a picture of what we're actually looking at, because what he's addressing in our postmodern culture is how the irony and the cynicism and the commercial of it commercialism is of it has devalued and robbed not just the individual and the group but also our expressions because everything is political everything's about power and there's nothing but fear and hatred in that those single entendre values that's all evaporated that's all gone we live in a post-moral world it's an image fiction world so people care about their reputations but reputation and image is not the same as morality and values so when you see that people have no values and they'll sell out to the you know the highest bidder you know you begin to see what happened to our society what happened to our culture again for a long time the capitalists have been saying yeah good little good be good little artists keep producing you know we will take the lion's share you'll get peanuts until there's nothing left and if you don't understand what i mean about this i'll go back to i think it was my very first uh, video in the series talking about player piano some of the excerpts from there about an increasingly automized society where you know they're building 3000 dream homes uh, for 3000 people who have the same dreams right we have a nation of people dreaming their television dreams and as they point out in that book you know but they've been taught to be competitive and hateful and mean and nasty and they've been taught and conditioned to live in this post moral uh, vengeful hateful society of image fiction where everyone wants to be the big winner and step on all the losers and you know and get get all the money right and get more and more and more as our society has always sold or has long sold right we abandoned temperance and all that shit like turn of the century uh really um you know and then the industrial model really set the pace and took took us from there but i was trying to paint a certain picture here of how we've been sold out and that's to say that when people have been conditioned to for hundreds of years and when they've been created as a commercial product through a factorial school model created by billionaires, you know, when they've been created to be this way and then their entire way of life and its viability as an economical model to survive on has been stolen and cut out from underneath them by their ruling class, by the ever more snobbish 15% who throws out ever and ever more of their own members into the proletariat, right into the outer party, you know, that with this all transpiring, it shows you where our cultural dividing lines now stand. You know, there is no individual. There's a party, there's an image fiction fabricated for social media and for television, and people are writing stories and drama all to fuel a never ending war right? Because there's what there's going on right now, in case you forgot, there's a war between three superpowers who own the globe, including all the slaves and uh, people in like kind of the equatorial zones like Africa and Egypt and uh, the Middle East, right? Because everyone's fighting over the resources and the rare earth metals. And technically, none of the superpowers needs the slaves or the manpower, but we do it anyway. And then our commercial culture is this veneer that has long existed over our um, our rapacious and ever more narrowing and destructive, self-destructive and destructive of other model, because again, it's all to fund a giant war machine. So, you know, uh, David Foster Wallace goes on to talk about irony's aura, because the whole problem with irony is it's tyranny. And we're going to get into that. So he says, it's widely recognized that television with its horn rim battery of statisticians and pollsters is awfully good at discerning patterns in the flux of popular ideologies, absorbing them, right, market research, marketers, processing them and then represented, representing them, right, representing them as persuasions to watch and to buy. Commercials targeted at the 80s upscale boomers, for example, are notorious for using 
processed versions of tunes from the rock culture of the 60s and 70s, both to elicit the yearning that accompanies nostalgia and to yoke purchases of products with what for yuppies is a lost era of genuine conviction, right? Uh, Ford sport vans are advertised with, this is the dawning of the age of the Aerostar. <laughs> Ford recently litigates with Bette Midler over the theft of her old vocals on Do You Want to Dance? <laughs> Claymation raisin da raisins dance to Hurt It Through the Grapevine, <laughs> etc. Oh, God, you guys are shameless. It's disgusting. If the commercial reuse of songs, the ideals they used to symbolize, right? This is the selling out of the images, right? We've become a hollow image culture. It's not like pop musicians or paragons of non-commercialism themselves, right? Because again, MTV had devised a lot of this anyway. It's, right? It was all, there were just, you know, there were commercial boomers behind it. Uh, and if you've heard my theory before that the boomer uh, was the peak uh, manufactured American, the peak commercial product of a human being where the government owns the copyright and the barcode. That's why... That's why they're stuck in the past, because they are so well designed. Um, heard it through the grapevine. Not like the pop music, right? So pop musicians are often sellouts and bad people themselves. And anyone, uh, anyway, he doesn't say bad people. I'm pointing out that a lot of what would pass is authority figures or popular figures or what were formerly role models, because once upon a time, a society and a culture generally wouldn't allow people who don't vibe with the values of a culture to be a role model in the culture, right? But now, these days, we have all sorts of people in leadership positions or influence positions who just have no business being there because all they have or all they are is a product or all they are is a system or for a system. They're not actually about life. They're not actually about human beings and what we really need. Uh, and in a system that it increasingly sells out and deprives people of what they need, Hello, loneliness epidemic. Hello, modern life. Hello, gray, numb world, right? So, uh, hello, again, why is the addiction to media so strong in the first place, right? This is the bigger issue, right? When people are addicted, it's because generally they're missing something in their lives. And I don't, I don't know how else to say it. And I don't mean that, like, oh, they just need busy work. I, I mean, they're, they're they, like, there's, there's something they could otherwise meaning, very simply, there's something they could otherwise meaningly be doing, uh, meaningfully be doing with their time, but instead they just waste it watching pointless commercial content. They help the worst people make money often, and there's a lot of commercialism and scams within our media culture, right? So it's not just that we're stuck watching someone else's production. None of it's authentic. Remember, guys, I keep saying this. I'll say no matter how authentic you think someone is on camera, they're they're still putting on a production of sorts. Even if, oh, that even if that is their shtick, even if that is their thing, even if they are authentic people, you might see me as an authentic person. Yes, but I'm also working through something here. So everyone has their motives, right? So um, the effects of the instance of TV absorbing and publumizing, I don't even know what that word means. Come on, David Foster Wallace. Cultural token seems innocuous. He's basically, but just absorbing and, re and deploying, uh, using, uh, parasitizing even, seems innocuous. But the recycling of whole cultural trends and the ideologies that inform them are a different story. Yes. U.S. pop culture is just like U.S. serious culture, right? He's saying low art is the same as high art in the sense that serious culture and that its central tension has always set the nobi nobility of individualism on one side against the warmth of communal belonging to the other. For its first 20 or so years, it seemed as though television sought to appeal mostly to the group side of the equation. Communities and bonding were extolled on early TV, even though TV itself, and especially its advertising, has come from the outlet projected itself to the at the lone viewer, i.e. Joe Briefcase, the average American, alone. Television commercials always make their appeals to individuals, not groups, a fact that seems curious in light of the unprecedented size of TV's audience. Until one hears gifted salesmen explain how people are always most vulnerable, hence most frightened, hence needy, hence persuadable, when they are approached solo. I think our politics and our, and our tribal politics and our group politics and the power politics uh, of it all, right, rabble fighting for power, um, classic television commercials were all about the group. They took the vulnerability of Joe Briefcase sitting there watching Lonely and capitalized on it by linking purchase of a given product with Joe B's inclusion in some attractive community. 
This is why those of us over 21 can remember all those interchangeable old commercials featuring groups of pretty people in some aesthetic, set con uh, aesthetic context having just way more fun than anybody has a license to have, right? He's saying it's fake, it's not real. And all united is a happy group by the conspicuous fact that they're holding a certain bottle of pop or brand of snack or a car or a politics or a corporate human resources slogan or double, you know, anything. And the blatant appeal here is that the relevant product can help Joe Briefcase belong. We're the Pepsi generation. Blech. You know, again, but since at least the 80s, the individualist side of the great U.S. conversation has held sway in TV advertising, right? And the, the rise of the influencer, the rise of images everything. Andre Ag Agassi said that, and so did a million other people since the beginning of time. Um, I'm not sure just why or how this happened. There are probably great connections to be traced with Vietnam, youth cultures, Watergate and recession, the new rights rise. But the relevant datum is that a lot of most effective TV commercials now make their appeal to the lone viewer in a terribly different way. Same thing with our news. Listen to this. Check this out. Products are now most often pitched as helping the viewer express himself, assert his individuality, stand out from the crowd. And look, I said this. And, and it's still here in its own form, but it's been corporatized. It's no longer your individuality. It's my phone, iPhone's individuality, right? It's the individuality that the product offers you by inclusion in the group, which was all to sell out anyway. Like, it was all to make money. So the idea that, you know, it's to express yourself, your individuality. No, I said a culture of me, myself, my face, my space, my group, you know, makes everyone sick. That this is part of the sickness. It, it's it's a par it's a parasitic condition. Commercialism has become a parasitic condition on humanity, on human beings. You you just can't have relationships anymore. You can't have anything when there's commercial need pervading every aspect of our society, and that it runs on fear and hatred through this sort of advertising. So. Products now often pitched as helping the viewer express himself, assert his individuality, stand out from the crowd, and it gets darker. The first instance I ever saw was, a per okay, he kind of gets into these of like these kind of commercials where think of every infomercial where it's black and white until person opens said product. And now all of a sudden they're living in a world of color, right? Now there's color in the world all because they're using, you know, the soda pop opener or whatever a name product some hack came up with. And then some other hack decided to market and then make a whole production over, you know. So it's crazy that Americans have always invested so much resources in garbage and pure commercial garbage. Um, this is my side rant and tirade. Uh, think uh, think the recent series of over dirty black and white cherry seven up ads where the only characters who got to have color and stand out from the surroundings are the pink people who became pink at the exact moment they imbibed the seven up. Examples of stand apart ads are ubiquitous nightly now, and day, to this day, you still see these things. Um, also, uh, those appealing to groups. Except for being sillier, products billed as distinguishing individuals from crowds sell to huge crowds of individuals. These ads aren't really any more complicated or subtle than the old join the fulfilling crowd ads that now seem so quaint. But the new standout ads' relation to their uh, mass of lone viewers is both complex and ingenious. Today's best ads are still about the group, but they now present the group as something fearsome, something that can swallow you up, a race you keep you from being noticed. But noticed by whom? Right? Who, what's, what's the game being played here? What is this shell game? Crowds are still vitally important in the Stand Apart ads thesis on identity. But now a given, a given ad's crowd, far from being more appealing, secure, and alive than the individual, functions as a mass of identical featureless, identical featureless eyes. The crowd is now paradoxically both the herd, in contrast to which the viewer's distinctive identity is to be defined, and the impassive witnesses whose sight alone can confer distinctive identity. You don't exist outside the party lines. You don't exist outside commercial lines. Do you see the problem? We've created a, a, a culture where the only thing that's real is what's commercially viable. The only thing that's commercially viable is kind of what appeals to people, and that's fear and hate and power, and that's what our algorithms and our marketers and the worst people, all these beetle-like men in between the scenes, right? Not the ideals. Remember, the ideals they sell you, the, the beautiful individual the, the, the supermodel, the ideal man, the ideal woman, the powerful man, the powerful woman, man in a suit, big metal watch, right? Woman in a dress, 
big old tits, lots of cleavage, right? All this stuff that's been shoved down the American's throat for decades, for decades after disgusting, you know, stink fist decades, right? has become bewildering and frightening to the point that most of our commercialism is about inspiring fear and hatred and manipulating people in the worst ways. So uh, it's created a horrible culture, a culture, uh, and a lot of it is revenge because men and women can't even have success there and no one can rise too high because they're a threat to anyone in power. So everyone eventually gets torn down because our 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 plebeian herd culture of this sort of commercialism and trained and conditioned to say, hey, he's, here are the commercial guidelines. You step out of that, it's your ass, right? Just like Winston in the party, it's your ass. So... Um, the, and, and this is again, but that's our art. And like, if anyone's wondering why I like anyone might have a right to talk about this or want to talk about this, it's our entire society and culture. It's our art. It's our politics. It's the individual and that emerges from the nameless herd. It's the individual that distinguishes themselves from the crowd. Yet the crowd is resentful and hateful and sold to in such manners and conditioned to then sell and be that way in return. So there's a lot of suspicion. There's a lot of snake oil. You know our system that has allowed more people to compete than ever and made more wealth for more people who were formerly in poverty has also made it easy for a lot of scam artists and a lot of predatory people to capitalize on that same herd that at the politics and the system supposedly exists to protect. So when I say we sold out not just our arts, but our way of life and our people and everything, this is what I mean. It is dire. It is serious. It is deadly. It is suicidal. It has serious ramifications not just for the existing generations, because I've talked about this. I get it. A lot of you, you have your piece of the pie. You continue to get your piece of the pie, or you checked out a long time ago, or you didn't want to get your hands dirty, or whatever your cope or your reason or your rationale. Everyone's got them. I know. We all got our alibis. We all got our excuses. We all got our reasons. Everyone's got explanations and reasons and blame. Blame is more popular than ever. Oh, you can just be a victim forever, and you can appeal to other people by telling them they're victims forever. Right, so this actually predates that uh, the how our post moral culture continued its moral facade in a kangaroo court of public opinion, you could say. But um, the lone viewer's isolation in front of his furniture is implicitly applauded. So formerly it was sitting in front of your TV, now it's sitting in front of your devices, right? So the lone viewer's isolation. Oh, okay. But let me finish the thought above. Crowds are still vitally important in the stand apart ad thesis on identity, right? You can't exist without a crowd to say you can exist, right? There is no you. We've been over this in 1984, actually. Um, more appealing, secure, and alive than the individual. Okay. But notice by whom. So crowds are still vitally important. But now, given the ad's crowd far from being more appealing, more secure, more alive than the individual, right? Like those happy go lucky, quaint Pepsi commercials functions as a mass of identical featureless eyes. The crowd is now paradoxically both the herd in contrast to which the viewer's distinctive identity is to be defined. Oh, this gives me an idea for their Kylie Jenner commercial in contrast to real American reality over the last few years. Um, but I'm going to keep going. The lone viewer's isolation in front of his furniture, furniture is implicitly applauded. It's better, realer, these solipsistic ads imply, to fly solo, and yet also implicated as threatening, confusing. Since, after all, Joe Briefcase is not an idiot sitting here and knows himself as a viewer to be guilty of the two big sins the ads decry. Being a passive watcher of TV and being part of a great herd of TV watchers and stand-apart product buyers. How odd, right? How odd, how psychotic, how, how weird, how contradictory. But it's so massive and circular that by the time anyone notices the difference, no one has time to stop making money on the disease. The disease has become the way of life, right? It's so much so that um, it, it has destroyed a large portion of the populace's ability not just to live, but to function as sane members of their society, to feel a part of anything that matters or feels real at all. Uh, it's the manufacturing of a fake reality. The, first, the surface of stand-apart ads still presents a relatively unalloyed by this thing, but the deep message of television uh, with regard to these ads 
looks to be that Joe Briefcase's ontological status is just one in a reactive watching mass in a deep way is in a deep way false. No, it's not. It's not your fault. It's, you didn't you guys didn't design this. No one here designed this. Everyone here was born into it and they've just been capitalizing. And the true actualization of self would ultimately consist in Joe's becoming one of the images that are the objects of this great herd like watching, right? This is the illusion, right? This is the fantasy we sell. Selling and here's what here's what drives is an artist, is a writer, this is what makes this is what annoys me about our unrealistic uh, culture of deception is that it's like artists are often told, well, these days it's just give us your money, we'll give you a degree. One, artists don't need to get degrees, neither do capitalists technically. You know, so one, that that, that, that became a profitable system and conveyor belt itself, no different than television, and now social media is one thing. But it's more like what I was trying to say is that the idea of being an artist is unrealistic or the idea of becoming massively successful but then that's just the that's the fantasy anyway what about just a minimal vi viable audience from a marketing perspective we focus on minimal viable audiences meaning just what do you need to make a living right do you have to conquer the world do you have to be greedy do you have to take everything do you have to right no not necessarily everyone's just trying to survive so what's the plan for a minimal viable audience right um but in our case we're talking about how within our culture, what is sold to the audience is that even with what I'm talking about, about our culture, the difference is I'm saying, hey, look what has happened to us. Look what certain people have done. Look what others are blamed for. Look at how these things have played out versus the advertiser sticking you with the knife, twisting the knife and saying, hey, look, you fucking, you little piece of shit. Like, this is why you need to vote Democrat. This is why you need to buy this. this is why you need to vote republican this is why you need to buy that right and it, you better be afraid and you know there's all sorts of drug peddlers and migrants and there's all sorts of uh, just r republicans everywhere right all sorts of crazy people everywhere right it's become really schizoid and the passivity of it is apparent in the tone right i've talked about this many times that in communication tone is more important than anything so anyone surveying the media landscape can see that fear, hatred, jealousy makes our market and our commercialism and our commercial world and our politics go around far more than love or God or brotherhood or unity. We've given up on a lot of these dreams. And I, I despise the fact that the dream of being an artist was ever sold as being less realistic than the corporate dream, right? That, that everyone was going to make it big there. No, you guys got sold out too. You guys got devalued too. But that's what our country has always been. Back to our Kurt Vonnegut Jr. essays or uh, work analysis, right? America has always been a mass of working poor, 85%. And then that, then the difference between the top five and 10 and five and uh, 10 and three and two and one, down, right, down, down the numbers, right? Like the, the divide is just, it's, as, it's the Marianas Trench, right? Versus here's the shallow end of our commercial culture that the people in the largest positions of power sell to the masses, right? The same people who might decry uh, you know, the merchants of death are the same people who often buy into it, right? The lottery tickets, the beer, the guns, the violence, the sex, all the cheap imagery, all the cheap commercialism, all the same American products recycled, the same trends done over and over again. You guys don't even create anything new anymore, right? Because I talk, this, these are class divides. These are personality divides. There's a big difference between a real artist and a real capitalist. And our society has a, done a great job of mucking the waters and destroying destroying distinctions and with the destruction of class and personality distinctions surprise surprise everyone's blind to the games being played everyone's supply blind to the uh, powers being leveraged and now that more yes more people are aware of them more people can act in a way they are still powerless before the wave of what is otherwise an indomitable and powerful culture of messaging and communications and politics that has formerly generated a lot of value for a lot of people but increasingly less so this is our 1984 territory saying hey we had a boom of general economic values going up but the whole aim with perpetual warfare it's not to continue to improve people's quality of life or even to make better art there was no, none of that is the goal the goal is is to do the bare minimum and destroy as much excess production as possible because you can't let your enemies have it and you can't let the proles and the other people have it because anyone becoming too smart or powerful is always a threat to power. So 
so this is what I'm saying is like the, the large groups and commercial organizations predate on the lone viewer, right? And then they also sell him the fantasy, whether that's the corporate image, the artistic image, become, become one of the images of worship of this great herd like watching that is tv's real pitch in these commercials right is when i said everyone wants to be an actor right in a certain sense most me a lot of americans they do want to be actors at least in some regard and a lot of the spectators are actors i once heard a brit speaking i think it was a brit if i recall correctly uh, and he said he said whenever he watches americans on tv whether it's the news social media it doesn't matter that whenever he sees them, he, he thinks that we've had media training. He thinks all of us have had media training. And it's like, yes, we have. Since day one, they've been advertising to us. Since day one, they've been conditioning us. Since day one, they've been putting us in institutions who, who train and narrow our ways of thinking and our ability to think and our ability to feel, right? So, and then, and then they, who, if you don't fit in, at least in a less conspicuous way, they will medicate you. They will chemically castrate you so you can fit into this psychotic culture. That's how you know it's so psychotic. You know, uh, how part of why it's so psychotic and how it is. So the, um, so that's sold, right? The image is sold. The people who watch often aren't the same as the representatives of the image. A supermodel is a rare type of human being. A poet and an artist, and, and you know, if you notice, how is it that so many artists are often so beautiful and attractive, right? These are rare types of personalities and human beings. So they're basically like royalty. They're a different class of people. And the, these are the images sold to people when they can't be that image, right? Do you see how these carrots are dangled on a stick, right? And even just... And now it's just basic survival even. It's, you can't even sell like, hey, be an average person, buy a house. You can't even dangle that carrot on a stick because none of the math adds up anymore because our commercial culture has sold itself out to the point of collapse. Um, and again, I get it. It's not anyone here's fault. Well, you know, it's not the pro's fault. So the lonely grandeur of stand apart advertising not only sells companies' products, then it manages brilliantly to ensure, even in commercials, that television gets paid to run, that ultimately TV and not any specific product or service will be regarded by Joe B as the ultimate arbiter of human worth, right? The, the media, whatever sticks in the media winds up being the fight in the communication therein. An oracle to be consulted a lot. Advertising scholar Mark C. Miller puts it succinctly, right? This is what you guys have all studied for a long time, market research. TV has gone beyond the explicit uh, celebration of commodities to the implicit reinforcement of that spectatorial posture which TV requires of us. Solipsistic ads are another way of televising ends up pointing at itself, keeping the viewer's relation to his furniture at once alienating and anaclytic, right? So you're, you're, you're hooked on it, but you don't exist without it, right? You have no concept of the world without it. So in another way of saying it is like within news, you could say, hey, when the news lies to you one day and then tells you a story that interests you the next, you just forgot that they lied to you. How do you know they're not lying to you now, right? Just here, right? You forget that the psychological manipulation is being worshipped. Oh, you better fit in. You better listen to what the talking heads and the government is saying and the commercials are saying and everyone is saying, oh, you don't want to mis make these mistakes. You don't want to be cringe. You don't want to make these faux pas. You want to fit in. You want to be this. You want to be that, right? Twist that knife in the insecure, self excessively self-conscious American. This is why when, it, when he says we're a protean bunch and an excessively self-conscious bunch, especially for our artists, this is why we've been conditioned to be this way. Media training basically from the cradle to the grave uh, media conditioning from the cradle to the grave psyoping from the cradle to the grave um, so basically it ensures the dependence it's an addiction right before it was six to twelve hours of social media addiction and all the neuroses and crap that goes along with that warp perception because sure enough just like 1984 discusses reality is in the head and if you're uh, consuming a world of uh, if you're living in a, a world of passivity and schizoid decay, as David Foster Wallace discusses, it's going to lead to a uh, mental problem. It's going to lead to societal breakdown. It's going to lead to political breakdown. It's going to lead to commercial breakdown, which we're seeing. The frauds will be manifest before the stories are changed and written and rewritten to be whatever they need to be. You know, 2008 is now in the memory hole. 2024 is going to be a big banger here. Um, that ultimately, so an oracle to be consulted, 
right? Okay, maybe though the relation of the contemporary viewer to contemporary TV, and I'm, I'm inserting social media, is less a paradigm of infantilism and addiction than it is one of the USA's familiar relation to all technology. We equate it once with freedom and power, slavery and chaos. For as with TV, whether we happen personally to love technology, hate it, fear it, right? All these conversations are old guys. This is from the 1990s. All you guys talking about this stuff now, you're saying nothing new. You need to get on the right track if you actually want to address any of this. If you want to have any meaningful affect with people. If you want to actually influence them and not just project these cruddy images in these dark images. We still look relentlessly to technology for solutions to the very problems technology seems to cause, right? More technology is more problems, guys. It's rising complexity. It's more chaos. It's more obsolescence of humanity. Catalysis for smog, SDI for missiles, transplants for assorted rot. Sounds so like Hunter S. Thompson there. Is the text so the gestalt of TV expands to absorb all problems associated with it. Right? It's like quicksand. It's like tar. The more you fight, the more stuck you are. Our politics, our identity politics, the corporation state, it's human resources language. That's the nature of doublespeak too. The pseudo communities of primetime soaps like Knott's Landing and 30-something are viewers soothing products of the very medium whose ambivalence about groups helps erode people's sense of connection. Right, The whole thing is alienating. The whole thing is cynical. The staccato editing Sound right, see, and you guys don't even know where you get these from. Like right now, we have kids and adults alike making commercial products. They don't even know where these trends and habits started. The staccato editing, sound bites, and summary treatment of naughty issues is network right. And think of um, was the other one um, a lot a lot of media shows are just like this. News accommodation of an audience whose attention span and appetite for complexity have atrophied a bit after years of high dose speculation. <coughs> Excuse me. But TV has tech bred problems of its own. The advent of cable, often with packages of over 40 channels, threatens networks and local affiliates alike. Oh, now we got infinite channels. Cable's increasingly dying off. Print is increasingly dying off. Uh, Americans generally don't read much anymore. Blogs were popular for a minute. Why do you need blogs when you have video casts, right? Like we just go on of how our media keeps going around and encycling and encircling and swallowing and selling itself, whatever, whatever, whatever's a hit, right? And a hit is a hit. And that's what the commercial product proves. That's what the market proves. So everyone studies to see if a hit's a hit, let's use it. If a bomb's a bomb, it works. It doesn't matter if it's the most destructive force in your culture, just drop it on the people anyway, right? Um, so threatens networks and local affiliates is particular true when the viewer is armed with remote control gizmo, right? No one's, no one has to be subject to your crappy, cruddy work, right? And we've seen this in a lot of bad media and media dying off in recent years. And by I mean bad media by, it's not giving the people what they want, right? Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to give, if, if your audience wants a certain thing, don't try to message to them. Don't try to pretend like you're something you're not. And a lot of this are these creepy, cruddy writers that, you know, David sort of starts talking about in this essay. It's a lot of these type of people, right? Weirdos who don't fit in, who find their place in fiction writing, in our commercial culture. This is where a lot of creative people go. A lot of, you know, psychopaths are better for politics. The more artistic are better for the commercials and the PR, right? Um, and that's how our culture, right? Just like the most brilliant chemists and, uh, uh, you know, psychologists, and uh, technicians of sorts, they work for the state, which is the military or Kellogg's, right? You see how our culture and the large corporation and the state just swallows everything because it's where the money is, it's where the funding is, it's where the fight is, it's where everything is. So there's nothing outside of it. So within this larger mass, again, it's supposed to be the thing that confers your identity, lone viewer, right? Lone person watching this. Yet you don't even know any of these people. Who do they exist in relation to? And it all exists within this passive schizoid decay of stagnant TV culture. So what, have, what does any of it even mean anymore, right? And this is where he says somewhere in here, a lot of us, you know, as far as the reactive types, a lot of us would prefer nihilism to Neanderthalism, right? So it's pretty funny, right? And I understand what he's saying, but let me keep going. Joe B is still getting his six total hours of daily TV and now six plus hours of social media, but the amount of his retinal time devoted to any one option shrinks as his remote scans a much wider band, right? Infinite channels, infinite shorts. Where's the brain rot? Uh, and then commercials disguising themselves as content. Uh, right, because some hack needs to make money. Someone you don't know needs to make money, so content. 
Worse, the VCR, right? And then even worse when they pretend to be authentic. Worse, the VCR with its dreaded fast forward and zap functions, right? Click, 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 uh, swipe, swipe, swipe. Humans, swipe, swipe, swipe. Worse, the VCR with its dreaded fast forward and zap function threatens the very viability of commercials, right? And then you've seen this evolutionary arms race over time. South Park did some episodes over it. You should check them out because uh, part of part of um, the infection of the American mind with a psychopathic commercial culture is as our own technologies helped us get away from the horrors of corporate life and commercialism and the dependency on large corporate organizations that sold out individuals and small business and small the ability to survive as a small business a long time ago you know made it almost infinitely harder and in some ways and then easier in others that they they're constantly figuring out how to take that back right when the house loses the house never loses what do you mean the house loses the house lost no no that was just temporary 2008, that was an example. 2024, this is another example. Adpocalypse was another example. Every time the higher class gets mad that the plebeian class has figured out how to make money, they're not paying their taxes, right? Every time the top 15% sees that the bottom 80, almost, I get it. There's there's a few good players of a few good games in our culture, but I'm, 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 I'm calling it like I see it. I don't see any, I don't see men. I don't see responsible men. I see actors. I see fakes. I see everyone selling a product. I see a few smart people. I see a few people trying earnestly. I see a few people that are somewhat respectable, but I don't see any men, right? I wish I could see some men. I wish I could see responsible men in our culture. I wish that sold. I wish that was viable as a way of life and that people could have families and that the society was remotely sane off of some sort of coherent and shared values like it once has because i'm getting ahead of myself here because he gets into what being drowned in images and psychotic non-stop bombardment of our senses is it's more akin to anarchy right and he understands the fears at the turn of the century because you know having infinite choices and no real guide it's closer to a bad LSD trip. It's like being stuck in the desert with nowhere to go, right? It is the nihilistic end of the line and logical conclusion of our schizoid passive image culture um, that ha has nothing outside itself, where there is nothing for the individual outside of it, right? You can't make money out there. There's no people out there. There's no ideas out there unless you can take anything from the fringes and turn it into a commercially viable product or one that sounds familiar enough to wait the way Americans have been conditioned and prefabricated to be in their thinking, in their feeling, in their medicated way of life, right? Because remember, a lot of people, they're on prescription drugs. They were given prescription speed and prescription Xanax and all sorts of uppers, downers, laughers, screamers, right? And then this has just been our way of life for a long time. There's also diet pills and recreational drugs. So there's something to all this, right? But I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I was going to try to do this in one part. But I see here that addressing irony and tyranny, because I hope you guys are seeing the irony of our predicament, of this situation, of that this is the 90s and time has stopped, you know, uh, because he's going to get into it with the very forecast of our future TC culture, right? We move from a TV, a televisual culture, analog waves to EM culture. We're going to go from a TV culture to a TC, a tele, telecomputer culture, right? And he makes predictions based on that, based on other tech writers predictions of times in the early 90s and this uh, these subject matters are spooky and they are accurate and again it's funny to see that from 1990 to 2024 time has stopped you guys are saying the same things you're stuck in the same ironic and cynical cycles the double speak has only gotten worse just like george carlin predicted it's a function of time is the decay gets worse as the reality before your eyes gets worse we have to ramp up the rhetoric and the language and the commercialism and anyway um this is part one of e unibus plurum from many uh from from one come many how how irony tyranny and our dark harvest of post moral image fiction have destroyed and rendered pathological the american way of life and the american mind thus the world's way of life and the world's mind because i with an all-pervasive ever-present war that is contingent on the success of our commercial culture you better believe we got our fingers in all pies you better believe that nothing is beyond our reach you better believe that there is nothing outside of big brother anyway uh this has been a review of David Foster Wallace's, uh, at least uh, 
review of some of his essay, E Unibus Plurum, Televisual Culture in the United States, getting into telecomputer culture and social media in the United States. I'll probably try and record part two a little bit later today and go a little bit further with the material here. So thanks again for your time, your attention. Hope you have a good one. Take care.